winner in any engine, in any car. Champion. Nigel Mansell wins his third consecutive race in the German Grand Prix at Hockenheim. But Ayrton Senna and Alain Prost resume their bitter feud following this incident. Those stories plus a look at some of the future stars of Formula One in the Formula 3000 race. A look at what's on the menu as we take a gastronomic tour of the Formula One kitchens. And a tribute to one of the great champions of all time, Jim Clark. That's all coming up on the official story of the FIA Formula One World Championship, Inside Track. About 85 kilometers south of Frankfurt is the Hockenheim Motor Racing Circuit, since 1986 the permanent home of the German Grand Prix. It's easily accessible by major motorways from all directions and is in the heart of one of the most beautiful parts of Germany. Not far from Hockenheim is the quaint medieval city of Heidelberg, known for its university, one of the very first in Europe. Its most famous landmark is the castle overlooking the city and the river Neckar. Heidelberg has a unique ambiance, making it a favorite for visitors all the year round. Certainly the Formula One fraternity enjoys patronizing the cafes and shops in the area. The circuit itself is unique in that all major amenities are easily accessible. The Hotel Motodrome is located just underneath the main grandstand, with access to the best seats in the house by just opening a door. Good time. Good times, this is Mr. Eric Burden. Das sind Oldies auf der Welle von 106,1 auf der Welle von Radio Hockenheim Ring. There's also a radio station to keep spectators entertained and informed. A crowd of close to 200,000 was expected over the weekend. And like all Grand Prix, the event attracted some very famous personalities. Well, I have to say, because of my schedule, it's very tough to, sometimes to, to continue to watch it, but. I've been in Hockenheim a few times and uh, I've been trying to pick up some on TV or follow it in the newspapers and for um, the past few years Ayrton Senna has been my favourite. Certainly for Ayrton Senna, the German Grand Prix here at Hockenheim would be another vital race in his quest to stay ahead of Nigel Mansell. The Englishman had won the two previous Grand Prix in France and England, narrowing the margin in the world driver's standings heading into this race. Senna's lead was now just 18 points, and with 10 for a win, Mansell was within striking distance. Certainly, Silverstone had been a personal triumph for Mansell, but also for Frank Williams, for the Williams team were now very close to McLaren Honda. Senna and McLaren were no longer the dominant force that they once were. I have to be honest, uh, we haven't had much progress since Simola both on the engine and on the car, despite some efforts which have been made. But, uh, of course, other people also improve, and the progress, in the end, made by everybody, uh, have, match, have been matched by each other. And the gap that was there right from the beginning has maintained itself, and maybe even extend a little more. So, while Hockenheim would be the venue for Senna and McLaren to try and hold off Mansell and Williams, for many, the circuit will always be remembered as the track where the legendary Jim Clark was killed. 
The spot where he crashed is marked with a memorial. Jim Clark was above all a gifted driver. Whether he drove at Le Mans, the Indianapolis 500, or in Formula One, Jim Clark excelled in every car with his smoothness, delicacy, and precision. Before his untimely death on April the 7th, 1968, in a Formula Two race, Clark had raced in 72 Grand Prix, starting on pole position 33 times and winning 25 races. He not only dominated Formula One, but was perhaps the best driver of his era. In 1965, for instance, there were 10 races in the World Championship, with the driver's six best results to count. At the Nürburgring in Germany, Clark won his sixth race, sealing the title by early August. In fact, the German Grand Prix was the seventh of the series, but Clark had missed Monte Carlo. He'd been away, winning the Indianapolis 500 that weekend. For me, Jim Clark was the best racing driver I ever drove with or against. He was smooth, he was gentlemanly, he was fast more than anything else. He was just the ultimate driver's driver. Because I saw how accurate he drove, how accurately he handled a car, the precision of his driving, the smoothness of his driving, I had to follow him a lot. We raced together a lot in the Tasman Championship. We raced Cortinas together. We raced Lotus Elans together, as well as Formula One and Formula Two together. And I think he was, for me, the master of going faster. Jim Clark was the most indecisive person I think I've ever met uh, outside of a racing car. In a racing car, all the decisions were made almost by computer, you felt. Outside of a racing car, he couldn't make up his mind which restaurant to go to, which movie to go to, which uh, anything to go to. Uh, I never forget as missing movies, missing restaurants, because by the time we had chosen the one that Jimmy felt we should go to, it was closed because we were going from one to another. What do you think is this one better? I think the epitome of the uh, Jim Clark saga on decision making is the one that I speak of when we were in Sebring for a, a 12 hour race together and we drove from our hotel to the Sebring racetrack and of course it's a very flat area of Florida. We had to cross a railway line without any gate so we stopped. Jimmy was driving and he looks left, he looks right and then he looks left again and there is nothing for 10 miles in either direction. And he turns around to me and he says, what do you think? <laughs> because he didn't want to make the decision on his own to go across a level crossing with 10 miles on either side in each direction with nothing there. It was a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's, it's kind of Jim Clark. Still to come on Inside Track, Satoru Nakajima announces his retirement. The drivers weigh in. And a look back at great German Grand Prix of the past, including Patrick Tambay's win for Ferrari in 1982. It's all coming up next here on Screen Sport. At the first race of the year in Phoenix, and then again at the halfway point in the season, FISA, the governing body of the sport, weighs each driver dressed in overalls with gloves and helmet to facilitate scrutineering during qualifying. Roberta Moreno was still the lightest in spite of putting on a kilo to weigh in at 59. Nigel Mansell was once again the heaviest, but had remained stable at an even 80 kilos as before. Jean Alesi used the occasion to show off his T-shirt. But for Tyrrell driver Satoru Nakajima, this would be the last time that he would go through this particular exercise. Earlier that afternoon, Ken Tyrrell had called a press conference to confirm that Japan's first permanent Grand Prix driver would be retiring at the end of the season. After winning five National Formula 2 championships in his native Japan, Nakajima started his Formula 1 career in the Lotus Honda Turbo in 1987. He scored seven points that year, finishing 11th in the championship. In three years with Lotus, Nakajima made a name for himself and became a national hero in Japan. He joined Tyrrell last year and was one reason why the team was able to secure use of the Honda V10 engine this year. But at 38 years old, Nakajima has decided he's had enough 
and will end his career in the Australian Grand Prix in Adelaide. But while this would be Nakajima's last German Grand Prix for 23-year-old Michael Bartels, it would be his first. Bartels will be standing in for Johnny Herbert at Lotus for four races, while the Le Mans co-winner fulfills Japanese Formula 3000 commitments. It represents a unique opportunity for a debut in Formula One in Bartels' native country. Among some of the interested onlookers in pit lane were former driver and now television commentator Patrick Tambay. Indeed, he won here back in 1982. It was in that race that leader Nelson Piquet, trying to lap Alicio Salazar at the second chicane, found himself squeezed out by the Chilean ATS driver, putting both cars out of the race and introducing Thai boxing to Grand Prix racing. Patrick Tambay wound up crossing the finishing line for a first-time Grand Prix win. René Arnoux was second, Keke Rosberg in the Williams third. Piquet's luck didn't change much the next year when his turbocharged Brabham caught fire and once again the Brazilian had to make a quick and unscheduled exit from his car. René Arnoux won for Ferrari in a year that saw the Italian team take the Constructors' title but it was Piquet who took the Drivers' Championship for Brabham. In 1984, another huge crowd was on hand as Alain Prost took pole in the McLaren Tag Porsche. Formula One rookie Ayrton Senna found the going tough as he spun his Tolman Hart turbo into the barrier, knocking him out of the race. Prost dominated the event from start to finish, but in the final analysis, his record-breaking seven wins that season still weren't enough to beat teammate Nicky Lauda, who won the world driver's title that year by half a point. Michele Alvaretto has won five Grand Prix in his career, the last coming back in the 1985 German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. Alain Prost was second in the race, but eventually took the world title, while Jacques Lafitte was third in the Ligier. In 1986, the burning story was fuel, or rather lack of it. Ayrton Senna weaved his car from side to side in order to pick up the last drops of fuel to cross the finishing line. But Alain Prost wasn't so lucky, for he rolled to a halt and, to the fans' amazement, tried to push his car to the line. Nelson Piquet won the race with Senna second and Mansell third. Piquet won for the second time in a row in 1987, but a year later, Ayrton Senna won the first of three consecutive German Grand Prix. The McLaren totally dominant as Senna and Prost finished 1-2. This despite an uncharacteristic spin in the early stages on a wet surface by Prost. The story was much the same in 1989, Senna and Prost on the front row of the grid and the pair finishing in that order. However, the race was marred by Emanuele Pirro spectacularly demolishing a huge polystyrene block in the escape road at the entrance to the stadium and suffering leg injuries. While Gerhard Berger also demonstrated the dangers of this high-speed circuit when he lost control of his Ferrari. In 1990, Senna and McLaren made it three German Grand Prix in a row, with another dominating performance. Senna first, Berger third. But 1991 would be a completely different story, as McLaren were no longer the dominant force heading into the second half of the season. And when we come back after the break, a look at how qualifying went as Senna and McLaren tried to halt the momentum of Williams, Renault and Mansell. That's coming up next on Inside Track on Screen Sport. Hungry stroll around a Formula One paddock and your taste buds will tell you that the quality of cuisine in the motorhomes is as good, if not better, than most restaurants. In fact, it's Grand Prix gastronomy. Top quality, international in variety and quite simply delicious. For the people who run the motorhomes, the day might begin at 6am with a trip to the market to pick up the freshest products. 
Upon returning to the paddock a couple of hours later, the preparation begins. Mechanics won't have a chance to eat until the qualifying session is over, so sandwiches are prepared to tie them over. Between 11.30 and 1 comes the casual sitting for lunch, but the workers, those involved, have to wait until after qualifying to eat at around 2.30 p.m. Formula One being what it is, the spirit of competition extends even into the kitchen. Karl Heinz Zimmermann of the Camel Motorhome takes us on a tour. This is the quietest time of the night. Uh, the English. That's the English kitchen from Blazing House. Bravo, nice dessert, cakes. Did you make them yourself? Cool. Bravo. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Let's have a look outside yes. what they have. English, absolutely. English, English, smoke Italian. All right. So half English, half Italian. Half Italian. Very good. Well, before we have seen the English kitchen, now we are at Ligier's kitchen. Our friends from France. Bonjour. Bonjour. Tu fais quoi là? Ben, je prépare le melon pour les mécaniciens. Le melon brosse tout. Et les mécaniciens mangent quand? À 14h30. Bon, bien. Et les, les sponsors maintenant? Les sponsors. Ah, bon. Bon. So he now prepares the stuff for the mechanics who are going to eat after second practice. And the sponsors, they've just eaten now. Maybe you still see a few out there having their lunch. But the real gourmet must wait until the evening. Zimmermann from Austria is renowned for the quality and style of presentation. And tonight he prepares a dinner for sponsors. They start with smoked salmon and caviar, followed by marinated venison that is lightly grilled and served with a tempting sauce. The food is superb and so is the wine, all part of a typical day in the paddock. Wine from Italy? Yeah. Ah, right. Or maybe... Yes, I know. Excellent. Well, I see you should serve this to our guests. It's very good. Right. You're going to serve it well. after dinner? Fantastic. In the motorhome. With this start to the second half of the season, the pre-qualifying cast had changed somewhat. The Lara, Lamborghini and Jordan had been moved up and been replaced by Brabham, Footwork and AGS, joining Bond Metal and Coloni in the Wide Awake Club. Martin Brundle ensured Brabham Yamaha of at least one runner. But how did pre-qualifying affect the team's plans? Well, we have to get up earlier on a Friday morning, of course. Pre-qualifying is a bit of a lottery. Here at Hockenheim, it went very easily for us, and I was easily the fastest. And in fact, because we had no major problems, it gave us more track time, so it worked out quite well for us. Gabriele Tarquini was a fine second quickest in the AGS, although he nearly joined teammate Barbazza as a non-pre-qualifier. I had a problem with uh, water temperature and uh, I wait the last uh, five minutes for the, um, for the qualified tire and uh, I try a good lap, I no traffic and uh, the car have a good balance and, and also quick, quick balance and uh, I am very happy to pass the pre-qualify on the first time uh, with AGS in pre-qualifier. Michele Alvaretto made it through pre-qualifying, where rejoining teammate Alex Caffey didn't, and Footworks man was third quickest, with Mark Blundell completing the top four after his first experience with the Wide Awake Club. On this ultra-quick circuit, there were surprises throughout the field in practice. Berger had won when Morbidelli spun, and the McLaren driver was forced, as it were, to spin in sympathy. Jean Alesi found that traffic is still a problem, even though this is the second longest Grand Prix circuit at 6.9 kilometers. It's a matter of weaving your way through, as Michele Alvaretto found. There are other hazards, however, as Riccardo Patrese discovered in qualifying, when a loose wheel from Mika Hakkinen's crashed Lotus caused him to abort a lap in Friday's qualifying session. But at least, Ricardo was ahead of Alain Prost in the Ferrari, sixth quickest and not entirely happy now with the car's V12 engine, which he found lacked torque, a complaint echoed by teammate Jean Alesi, who was fractionally quicker than his older compatriot, 
both hoping that new mapping would improve matters. Surprisingly, Ayrton Senna was only fourth in this qualifying session, the Brazilian suffering only a mildly stiff neck after his huge accident in testing here and losing one set of tyres when a shower of rain dampened the track late in the session. Patracy ended up third quickest, held up by the errant tyre on one run and slowed by the drizzle on the second, but naturally hopeful that there was more to come the next day when he might wreak revenge on his teammate. Gerhard Berger was an encouraging second quickest and very happy with his car, although he confessed that while his McLaren Honda was a match for the Williams Renaults in the stadium section, the French engine had the edge on the straights. And it was Mansell who was quickest in both sessions on Friday, ending up on provisional pole in the Williams Renault in spite of a couple of small mistakes. Given these mistakes, Mansell was happy, particularly as no one was able to improve in the dying minutes of the session when the umbrellas came out because of a light drizzle. Well, we've got a very, very good balance on the car, which allows us to take a lot of wing off. I think uh, we're running the least wing in the pit lane, and because of that, we're going exceptionally fast down the straight. A um, little bit difficult in the medium speed corners and the infield, but uh, you know, I'm very, very happy with that. While the conclusion of Friday's qualifying marked the end of the day's action on the circuit for Formula One cars, there was still plenty to see at Hockenheim as the Formula 3000 cars warmed up for Saturday's sixth race in the championship. There are basically only three makes of car in the series, Lola, Reynard and Ralt. The technical differences between cars are marginal, so it's talent and driving skill that separates teams and drivers which is why Formula 3000 has always been considered the breeding ground for Formula 1 stars of the future. Christian Fittipaldi, son of ex-Formula 1 driver Wilson and nephew of the former world champion Emerson, currently leads the Formula 3000 series and was rumoured to be negotiating to make his Formula 1 debut at Spa later this year. Damon Hill, son of the legendary Graham Hill, is already on a testing contract with Williams and seems destined for Formula 1. I'd ideally like to be in Formula 1 next year because I feel I've, I've had two seasons in, uh, two full seasons in 3000. Uh, this season's not gone that well and I, I feel like I need a fresh challenge. Uh, if necessary, I'll do another year in 3000 and hopefully things will be better and I'll win races uh, and go to Formula 1 then, but however long it takes, but I'd like to be in next year. Glamour and brains and skill are provided by Giovanna Amati driving for the GJ Motorsport team. It's a macho en environment, this one. Then it's difficult to accept a woman uh, to get in, you know. But I'll try anyway, I, you know, I, I never give up. Eddie Jordan has enjoyed tremendous success in Formula 3000 in the past and still actively participates in the running of the Barclay team despite his demanding Formula 1 schedule. Jean Alesi drove for Jordan when the EJR team took the Formula 3000 title in 1989. The Ferrari driver still has plenty of friends in the series. One look up and down pit lane and it was clearly evident that the current Formula 1 stars are keeping an eye on those who could be threats to their careers in the future. Back to Formula 1 now and Saturday's free practice session was just a few minutes old when the session had to be stopped. Eric Comas had crashed out of the Ostkurve chicane, and although he was able to crawl from the wreckage of his crashed Ligier Lamborghini, there was a fair amount of debris on the circuit, and it was clear that the track had to be cleared. Comas himself appeared unhurt as he took off his helmet, although the marshals crowded around him to help him. I don't know what happened exactly. I was flat on six just before the second chicane here on Okenheim, and uh, just before I... Uh, but. 50 meters before I break. The wheel moves a lot and the car uh, go on the, just a little on, on the left and then I, I spun and uh, I, uh, I crash. But uh, I don't know exactly why. Formula One is very cautious about injuries and although Comas appeared unhurt, he was flown to a nearby hospital for a checkup in case he was suffering concussion but he was given a clean bit of health and was soon back in the paddock. And how was your health now? It's uh, very good as yesterday. Uh, in fact, I was very shocked after uh, 
this crash because it was very quick, but uh, the medical bilan is very, very good, nothing at all. So we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, sure. <laughs> this was only the start of an incident-packed morning. Senna, for instance, had this hairy moment in front of teammate Berger as they braked for a chicane. Berger took a rocking roller coaster ride onto the dirt out of the first corner, but managed to keep the car fairly straight and didn't hit anything. Guzelmin had a spin on his own oil when his engine blew and sent him off the track at the third chicane, his Leighton House Ilmore nearly bouncing back into the circuit again. And Pierluigi Martini had this little spin in his Minardi Ferrari in the stadium area which fortunately ended fairly harmlessly for the Italian driver. It was all part of a busy morning, which also saw the world champion having an off at the first chicane. Or was this a visit to inspect the facilities for later in the weekend? But the real action was to get underway in the afternoon for final qualifying. On the face of it, the Williams drivers had every reason to be confident. Mansell had been fastest in every session since the French Grand Prix, but Patrese wasn't so happy. The Williams mechanics were still sorting out a gearbox problem and changing his Renault engine after problems in the morning. Once out on the track, Patrese set a time just four tenths slower than his pole-winning teammate, and it might have been quicker but for finding himself a gear higher in a chicane, which resulted in a hairy moment. No, I had to change the gearbox, uh, and this, uh, the gearbox uh, had a problem this morning. They changed the gearbox this afternoon, had a gain of uh, malfunction, uh, malfunctions uh, in the in the gearbox. Unfortunately, he, he didn't like to changing down from fifth to fourth, so he was uh, sometimes stuck in fifth instead to go to fourth. And tomorrow, it's a question of all about reliability, isn't it? We will see. I think we are okay for the race. Gerhard Berger slipped from second to third. His best time slightly slowed when his McLaren Honda went a little wide at the end of the lap as his tyres were virtually finished on this long circuit. Teammate Ayrton Senna, on pole for the last three years at Hockenheim, adopted a low downforce setup for maximum speed on the straights. But as a result, he found the McLaren difficult to control and this year had to be content with second quickest time. Ron Dennis's team sandwiched between the Williamses. For just two tenths quicker than Senna was Nigel Mansell in the Williams. They seem to be the right set, the right settings, the right, the right compromise for corner speed and straight line speed. And uh, we improved a lot from yesterday and uh, it's good to to have uh, improvement from the first day to the second day. Mansell was fastest anyway when he went out at the end of the session and came upon the unfortunate Comas, who had spent most of the morning in the hospital and was now desperately trying to get into the race. He was trying to get through the chicane as quickly as he could, but got short shrift from Mansell, who, after having a few words with Comas in the pits, had more with the stewards after his impetuosity. Senna then on the front row and not happy about it, but as his frustration mounts, there is light at the end of the tunnel for the Brazilian. We are waiting for new things soon, uh, and we have to, to give time, but uh, I think for the difference we are looking for to catch the Williams, it, we need a lot more uh, than we are going to have soon, and, uh, and we need it fast, of course, because the championship is it's still open for me, and uh, with, the, with the performance that uh, the, the Williams Renault have got right now, we just cannot compete with them. And uh, if we want to compete in the championship, we need those improvements very soon. Later that afternoon came the Formula 3000 race. Andrea Montermini was on pole and leading the race when he had to retire with engine problems. Emanuele Naspetti of 40 Course International eventually won for the second time in succession, moving him up to third place in the overall standings. Well, every race is important to win. Obviously, in this circuit today, it was a little bit more important than another, but honestly, I didn't think about this when I drove the car. I just think, talk about drive well, and go to finish the race the best as possible. 
Finishing second was Vincenzo Sospiri from the Barclay team, followed by Austria's Carl Wendlinger. After the day's racing was over, Hockenheim's nightlife began. Braun of Germany held a party that was so exclusive that even Gerhard Berger had trouble getting in. We can report that the McLaren driver was eventually able to gain access and share the evening with compatriot and former ski champion Harty Weirata. But as the sun set, not everyone was socialising. As darkness fell in the garages along pit lane, the mechanics were, as usual, working late into the night, preparing the cars for the next day's Grand Prix. So while the party continued, so too did the preparations for round nine of the FIA's Formula One World Championship, the German Grand Prix from Hockenheim, coming up next on Inside Track, here on Screen Sport. And the warm-up begins. The teams need this vital hour for final race tuning and checking. The stadium sections are already almost full, despite the race being some four and a half hours away. Outside, thousands more are heading for their seats. Nigel Mansell seems to be an obvious crowd favourite. While Ayrton Senna, well... At 11am comes the driver's briefing. Visa president Jean-Marie Balestre and race starter Roland Brunserider go through several changes that will be instituted for the race. And drivers were asked to form up on the grid more rapidly. Then came a discussion on the tower barriers at the chicanes. In order to try to find a solution to improve, <coughs> I don't know if it's possible or not in case of a car failure or a driver mistake. And uh, as, a, as a result of it, the barrier, the tire barrier was changed to an angle one, right? I think, in my opinion, that's not good enough. And in order for us to have a proper runoff failure, we shouldn't have those tires there. Because when we have a, a, a failure in the car, the tire blow up, or if we make a mistake and we go, or if we hit the two cars, we hit the barrier and it's like a wall because it's, 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 it's much too speed. You can't can can let, 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 let me just finish. And if, and if, and if, 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 you happen to hit those tires and you don't get hurt by the impact. I know, I know that there was an accident on the third chicane yesterday by an engine failure, okay? And that happened before the chicane when the driver felt the engine was blown. And he decided still to drive to the chicane because to go straight there was a barrier there and he would hit the barrier. By trying to go straight with oil coming out from the back of the car, he went off and he had a crash. If it was a clear road to escape, he wouldn't have had the accident. May I add that? Yes. What can do today for the race? For the race, we can do anything. We can I, change anything. I think, I think, what we can do, I think, I, we can all see here, I think, better to not have those tires there because if you have a, if you have an accident in Germany, if you have a crash or a car failure, when you hit those tires, first of all, they throw you up in the air and you end up rolling. And, and then you just finish. And if you don't, if you don't roll up in the air, depend on the speed, they are like a wall and you have no ability to escape. In order to rejoin the circuit, I have to drive off the circuit, over the grass, over the stone. 
which can give you a puncture and you have an accident later. But we know, but we, the present problem is what is your solution? I, sh I think we should take those tires away. I think just time or move the tire. Yeah. If you move the tire, you must place. On doit placer au moins ce qu'on appelle les causes. Les causes. Oui, c'est pour ça que je pense. Vous pouvez pas mettre un dozen de fonds. Vous n'avez pas besoin de mettre deux ou trois fonds. Et ils ne peuvent pas fermer la route. Donc, quelqu'un qui est venu. Nous, les Américains, nous devons nous arrêter. Pour que le marshal vienne venir. Mettre le fonds à la fin. Et le fonds à la fin. Alors, M. Mantel, s'il vous plaît. Oui, c'est bien. Nous comprenons. Nous comprenons. Nous comprenons. Je suis d'accord avec beaucoup de ce que Ayrton a dit. Je veux juste dire une chose. Si la route est ouverte et que quelqu'un a perdu son point de vue et qu'il vient en ligne droite, What's the time penalty they're going to get? Because for uh, sure... It's exclude. Because it's exclude. It's exclude. If it's just left on the race, huh? No. He has to yes. Stop. No. He has to stop. stop. No. He must stop. He must wait for the match to be the time to go. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. not what I mean. Exactly why, exactly why, if you put the phone there, no. the guy has to stop. Yes. If he goes quickly, then it's the car. He'll be out anyway. Yes. Okay? And then so, he so, if you put the phone there, <coughs> the guy has to stop. And the... And so, as start time approached, Nigel Mansell was on pole, and without doubt, the man to beat. For him, there was nothing ahead but a clear track. Ayrton Senna had seen his huge lead in the World Championship standings whittled down to just 18 points. A top three finish would be vital in order to maintain his lead. With the track very rough in some areas, tyres would also be a vital factor today. Gerhard Berger was concerned about the severe blistering he had suffered on both hands at Silverstone. He opted to remove the protective tape. And the usually effusive Ferrari fans were doing their best to get the attention of Jean Alesi. But the Frenchman had other things on his mind. And as we see from Gerhard Berger's McLaren, the cars on the grid with his 45 lap German Grand Prix, N Nigel Mansell and Ayrton Senna on the front row, Gerhard Berger and Riccardo Patrese on row two, Alain Prost and Jean Lacy in the Ferraris on row three, then De Cesaris and Piquet, Moreno and Martini, that's the first ten, then Gasho and Capelli, followed by Nakajima and Modena, Brundle and Guzelman. The red lights came on, and at the green, Nigel Mansell made a superb start coming across in front of Ayrton Senna, who didn't start well. Berger overtook him, and the fer two Ferraris got ahead of Riccardo Patrese. At the back of the field, Nicola Larini and Mark Blundell had a spin, but everyone got away apart from Nicola Larini. The Italian driver, out of only his second race so far this year, scarcely before it had begun. Meanwhile, at the front of the field, Mansell had already pulled out from Gerhard Berger, then Ayrton Senna, then the two Ferraris, Riccardo Patrese, Andrea De Cesaris, and the two Benettons. Mansell easing away from Berger and Senna, then Prost and Alesi, then Riccardo Patrese, De Cesaris, and then Piquet ahead of Moreno. Through the third chicane, and already Mansell putting his stamp on this race, even though it was as early as the first lap. Further back, Jean Alesi was trying to keep Riccardo Patrese at bay. And Gerhard Berger was even pulling away from teammate Ayrton Senna. Patrese passed Jean Alesi and now comprising a Ferrari sandwich. Berger, and then Prost, putting pressure on Ayrton Senna, with Riccardo Patrese making it a trio, and just behind, Jean Lacy making it a quartet. But Mansell and Berger were pulling away. Senna fighting for third place, with his arch-rival Prost behind him, while Eric Bernard retired out on the track. Pierluigi Martini had a second spin, this time because of a blown engine. And while Martini prepared to get out of his car, Mansell and Berger were pulling away from the third-place battle. Senna, Prost, 
Patrese and Alesi still battling over third place. First of those to stop for new tyres and having a hairy moment as he came in was Gerhard Berger. This was a scheduled stop, but what happened next was not scheduled. First of all, there was a flicker of flame at the back of the car. And then there was a problem with the front right wheel. All in all, Berger was stationary for 16 seconds, probably twice as long as he should have been. Joining Minardi Ferrari teammate Pierluigi Martini as a retirement was Gianni Morbidelli. Calling over the marshals to put out a small fire at the back of the car. Ayrton Senna came in for his tyre stop. At the same time, so did Alain Prost. Now it was a battle in the pits, the mechanics against one another. But Ayrton Senna was out first, closely followed by Alain Prost, the two taking up station again out on the circuit. While into the pits came Andrea de Cesaris in the Jordan Ford. Senna and Prost reforming their battle. Then into the pits came leader Nigel Mansell. It was a good stop. But while he was there, Jean Alesi went past. The Frenchman was not intending to stop for tyres. Patrese now led Alesi and then Mansell. Alesi had started on Goodyear's harder B compound tyre and was hoping to go all the way through the race without a stop. He found himself in the lead when Patrese came in for his scheduled tyre stop. And that dropped Patrese back into his position just behind Senna and Prost. This was now the battle for third place. Alesi, however, was out in the lead. But on his older tyres, he was soon gained on by Nigel Mansell. And on the long drag down to the Ostkurve chicane, Mansell got in the slipstream, pulled out, and went back into the lead again. Alesi down in second place. Patrese was able to make short work of the pair in front of him getting past Alain Prost fairly easily to slot into fourth place. Just ahead of him was Ayrton Senna and it infuriated Alain Prost to see Patrese easily overtake Ayrton Senna and move into third place. As Mansell continued on his winning way Nelson Piquet retired at the side of the circuit. Alesi in second place was then caught by Riccardo Patrese. And Patrese, having reeled in the Ferrari, was able to move up into second place, pushing Alesi down to third. Finally, the race-long battle between Senna and Prost came to a head at the first chicane. Prost trying round the outside, locking up a brake and going straight on past the cones that had been placed there. Prost had to make a three-point turn but regrettably had lost his clutch. Now this is it again. Prost trying to squeeze past, no space, into the cone, off down the escape road and out of the race. Mansell, however, was safe. Way out in the lead, he delighted his fans as he headed for the chequered flag. Nothing surely could stop him now. For Ayrton Senna, however, there was a sting in the tail because quite suddenly the engine died. Once again, he'd run out of fuel, even though his computer readout was telling him otherwise. 
and he was out of the race just as he had been at Silverstone. Senna then, a retirement on the last lap. No such problems for Nigel Mansell as he took the chequered flag for the third consecutive race. Victory for Mansell, a 1-2 for Williams. On the rostrum, it was Jean-Marie Ballest, the FISA president, who is the main target of the champagne for the first three. The two Williams drivers and Alesi filling the rostrum. Gerhard Berger in fourth place. De Cesaris and Gasho picking up the final two lots of points. But for Alesi, his tyre choice was vital to his third position. It was especially at the warm-up we, we worked a lot about uh, a setup for to keep the same uh, the same tires for all the race. Uh, Pro decided uh, other things. He start uh, with less downforce with uh, C tires, but um, because it was impossible to to start for the win, as uh, without problem uh, from my uh, other fr uh, drivers. I said, uh, I think it's the best to do is to stay on the circuit and to, to try to finish with the same set. And you couldn't uh, keep uh, ahead of uh, Ricardo? Not at all. Nigel Mansell's victory brought him 10 points closer to Ayrton Senna in the championship after the Brazilian failed to score. But the race wasn't as easy as it looked for Mansell. It was a tough race uh, for many reasons. One, uh, because the engine is 65% flat out, you have to be very careful with that. And then also the tyres, I think I've listed one of my sets of tyres, and I think Ricardo and I both had the similar problem with a very long brake pedal. That, uh, it's quite difficult. The 1-2 finish for Williams-Renault put them into a one-point lead in the Constructors' Championship. Mansell, Patrese and Williams-Renault enjoying a superb season. It looks like I'm very happy for the team because they deserve to be in the lead at this moment. The car is going fantastically well and everybody's doing a great job. And about my race, I think I had the, the same problem of Nigel. And on the top of those, I, I started six out of the grid, so I had to overtake a few people. And now the retirements. We saw Larini, Bernard and Martini and Morbidelli. Suzuki went out with engine problems, so did Hakkinen on this long, fast circuit. Guzelman went out with a broken gearbox. Perhaps not as many retirements as expected in spite of the heat and the nature of the track itself. Other retirements included Eric Comas after his brave drive. More mechanical problems for Nakajima, P.K. Leto, a misfire for Ivan Capelli and of course Alain Prost stalled. But the big talking point after the race was not Prost's retirement, but his reaction to it. That was clearly evident when Senna stopped at the same runoff area where Prost was already parked. Both drivers ignored one another and made clear their feelings when interviewed after the race. I can't win the championship, but uh, if I find him again the, the same way, if he's correct the same way, I push him out. That's for sure, because I, I can't uh, also accept that uh, the FISA, I mean, uh, they, they put $10,000 fine to Guggenmin or Suzuki and Maniku and uh, Silverstone, and they ne never do anything for, for top drivers. And uh, uh, if you have a rule, it must be the same for everybody. I think everyone knows Prost by now. He is always complaining either by the car or the tires or the team or the mechanics or the fuel or or the other drivers, or the circuit. It's always somebody else blame, it's never his fault. I think, uh, I haven't seen television, but it should be on television. It's clearly that he overshoot under braking. He risked a lot there. He could have put himself in an accident and also involved me in that. And uh, fortunately, we didn't touch, but uh, it almost cost me an accident there, and he almost cost him an accident too. So, as we head to Hungary for round 10, there's a new twist to Formula One's ever-changing script. While Mansell has edged closer to Senna, Prost has pledged to help unseat the world champion. Round 10 and the Hungarian Grand Prix is next on the Formula One calendar. <laughs>